Um, but yeah, we're, we'll start off this evening with the part one and part two. Um, Dr. Kulhanik will start off with um, her presentation and we'll go about 40 minutes or so in the period of Q&A, and then we'll do a short bio break, and then we'll switch over to Dr. Morphine and, um, and then hear what, what she has to say. So really looking forward to it. Dr. Um, Kulhanik comes to us from Washington State University. And so, yeah, I'll stop share. And floor is yours, Kelly. Thank you, Melanie. Let me share. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to speak um, at this mini conference. I think, you know, us all learning to, to use Zoom over the last couple of years has some pros and cons, but it's nice to be able to talk to audiences that I think we wouldn't normally get to. So um, yeah, I'm super happy to be talking to everyone tonight. Um, my title here is Varroa Population Growth and Spread Between Apiaries. Um, and so a lot of this work is work I did during my PhD actually at the University of Maryland. Um, and sort of with the Be Informed partnership there. So um, I'll sort of introduce all of that in a minute. But first, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, so I completed my PhD from University of Maryland in April of 2020. Um, I'm originally from San Diego, California. So it's nice for me to be sort of back on the West Coast over here. Um, it was very, very humid back there on the East Coast. <laughs> Uh, which was not a lot of fun for beekeeping, um, but uh, it was a great place to get my PhD. Um, and like I said, I finished in April 2020. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, my defense was over Zoom, my like celebration party and everything was all over Zoom. So kind of a really weird time to finish a major milestone um, and then move cross country uh, to here to Washington State. Um, where I started my postdoc in August of 2020. So um, I've been here since um, August of 2020 working as Brandon Hopkins postdoc. So he hired me to help with a lot of his work he does on commercial beekeeping management practices and, um, you know, specifically with the indoor storage of honeybee colonies. So I helped a lot with lots of different projects around indoor storage, which is um, a very cool and interesting management practice. If anyone's not familiar, I'd be happy to come back and do a whole nother talk just about indoor storage. It's really pretty fascinating how unnatural it is, but how well it works for these beekeepers. Um, and I just like to put this map of Washington State up here for people who aren't familiar with where we are. So we're located here at the Pullman campus in Whitman County. It's the nation's number one wheat producing county. So um, not at all like the lush, green, forested western side of the state. It's very dry over here, really hot. We've been under like excessive heat warning the last week and a half. Um, and pretty much all wheat, um, our main source of nectar flow out here is canola. So um, yeah, it's, it's been very different from, you know, where I did my PhD in Maryland and I've gotten a lot more experience with sort of these bigger commercial operations um, out here on the West Coast as well. So that was a really great experience as a postdoc. And then just about two months ago, um, I actually got a promotion and started a new position as an assistant professor here um, on June 1st. So I've been you know, in this role for almost exactly two months, so pretty fresh. Um, I just made my lab website like last week. So just all those sort of little um, nuts and bolts of building a lab that I'm just starting to take on right now. So it's been really exciting and really happy to be sort of a more permanent part of the WSUB program. And hopefully, you know, I know I have some Washington beekeepers on here. I'm sure I'll get to know a lot of you um, and in neighboring states um, in the years to come. So very happy uh, to be in this new position. But like I said, today, I'm actually going to go kind of back in time a little bit. Um, kind of back to my PhD. And the reason for that is that the work I did there um, was pretty much entirely revolving around small stationary apiaries. So more of a hobbyist beekeeping situation where we have smaller apiaries where the hives aren't moving, you know, they stay in one place all year um, and just sort of on a smaller scale. And I think, um, you know, for groups like this, there are usually a lot more hobbyists in the audience. So hopefully a lot of this information will be directly applicable to most of you. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to talk about the Be Informed Partnership 
And the Be Informed Partnership is um, sort of this nationwide nonprofit organization that does research and extension and tries to work directly with beekeepers to um, diagnose problems in their colonies um, and sort of just compile lots of data too on the state of beekeeping in the US. And the reason I got to work with Be Informed so much was because when I was at University of Maryland, my advisor, um, Dennis Van Engelsdorf, was the president of Be Informed and the diagnostic lab, um, which receives you know, thousands of samples from operations all over the country, was located um, in our lab at Maryland. So I was sort of like right at the epicenter of this nonprofit that has all these collaborating universities all over the country and works with all these different beekeeping operations of all different shapes and sizes. So I really got a lot of great hands-on experience uh, working with different types of beekeepers. Um, and so, you know, here's an example of where some of those collaborating universities are. So here we were headquartered in Maryland um, and you can see we've tried to be pretty spread out and we've tried to be um, sort of where big epicenters of beekeeping are in the United States. So, um, you know, this branch here at UC Davis works very closely with all the queen producers that are located in the Central Valley of Northern California there. Um, the branch here in Minnesota tries to work very closely with um, beekeepers who are in the, Deco the Dakotas, trying to make honey every summer. And so, um, you know, the sort of overarching goals of Be Informed are to look at how management practices and other factors affect honeybee health. So, you know, again, we're working with all these different beekeepers of all different shapes and sizes and gathering a lot of information about their colony health and their management. And so we can sort of start to put together trends about which management practices seem to work really well um, and beekeepers consistently have good success with them compared to which ones seem to not help as much, seem to not be as worth the money, um, seem to not really make that much of a difference, um, all that sort of thing. And so the goal is really to work with beekeepers to improve colony health and survival. And so that research is informed directly by beekeepers and also that the information we pass back is getting to you in a timely manner and is useful and applicable information. And so one of the most important things that the Be Informed Partnership does is this annual loss of management survey. Um, and I've included these results here because they came out like two days ago. So this is super hot off the press information. You can see the year 2022 down here all the way at the end of the X axis. So this is just the most recent winter survey. And so what we're looking at here is just um, the percentage of colonies that were lost over the summer period, which is April 1st to October 1st, over the winter period, which is October 1st to April 1st, and then over the whole year, so April 1st to April 1st. Um, and you can see that that annual loss rate uh, this past winter uh, was a little bit lower than the couple of years prior. So that's pretty good news. We had a couple really high years uh, in 2020 and 2021. That was just a tough year for everybody for lots of reasons, I guess. Um, but yeah, according to the survey, everybody did a little bit better last year. So um, yeah, this is one of the most important things Beautiform does is this annual loss and management survey, just tracking the turnover rate of colonies in the US, right? Because um, before this survey, before 2008, which you know is right after colony collapse disorder started happening. Um, no one was really tracking this turnover rate. We knew how many colonies were present in the United States from year to year. You know, we knew 1.8 million in this year to 2 million in the next year, but we didn't really know how many colonies were dying each year. And so, you know, this is obviously a very important part of the picture to capture um, to understand what beekeepers are really dealing with. Um, how much they're having to make up for losses every single spring. Um, and so, yeah, super important information. If you're interested in taking the survey, it comes out on April 1st each year. Everyone can and should take it. It's all important data to count. Um, and then, you know, Be Informed also has all these different programs, all different shapes and sizes of beekeepers. Um, the tech transfer teams are the branch that's sort of dedicated to working specifically with commercial beekeepers. 
there are these teams of one or two like highly trained specialists that will actually go to the commercial operations, inspect and sample hives, um, and actually try to diagnose problems for those beekeepers. Um, you know, a couple different types of surveys. The one I'm going to talk about um, that was part of my PhD work here is this. Um, sorry, that's the wrong one. The Sentinel Apiary program right here. Um, and so the Sentinel Apiary program is a colony health monitoring program, and it's really specifically geared towards a smaller scale beekeeper. So um, I think now you could participate even at a two colony level. But when I was there, you needed to have four or eight colonies in an apiary um, to participate in this program. And the idea is really to track the colonies um, over an entire season from sort of May to October to get a really good idea of how that colony health is fluctuating over the season. And so um, what this looks like is, you know, again, we have an apiary with four or eight colonies. And those same hives are monitored over a period of six months. So usually um, for most of us, that's starting in May and going through October, a little bit of flexibility there for people who wanted to start earlier, you know, beekeepers further south who it's warm enough earlier in the season where they wanna start taking samples sooner. But um, the beekeeper enrolls with the Bee Informed Partnership in this program, and then they sort of are mailed all this equipment that they need to inspect and sample these colonies for these six months. And so they're mailed um, little sample bottles and a funnel and a quarter cup scoop so that they can sample adult bees for Varroa and Nosema. Um, they're sent data sheets and protocols and instructions. Um, and I, there are instructional videos and everything too um, on how to perform an inspection for queen status, brood pattern, and frames of bees. They also record any management information. Um, you know, if they treated for mites that month, um, if they fed, if they requeened, uh, any management that went into those hives in the past month, they record that on their data sheet as well. And then of course, we're also tracking whether any of these colonies die. Um, very few die over the active beekeeping season, but we do try to follow up with them uh, the next spring to see how their overwinter mortality went as well. And so um, basically how this works is we ship, you know, all the little sampling supplies and the data sheets and everything. Um, and then the beekeeper takes the samples themselves. So, you know, just your typical a sample looking for a frame with some open brood on it. So you get some nurse bees sampling about 300 adult bees uh, into this little bottle. And then um, those samples get shipped back to the lab at University of Maryland where they get processed for Varroa and Nosema. And then the beekeeper also fills out a data sheet with um, you know, all this great information, queen status, brood pattern, all this good stuff, all these notes. Um, and you know, receive, I received hundreds of these data sheets um, over the couple of years I was in charge of this program. And it was always such an interesting snapshot of what happened to that beekeeper that day in the field. Um, you can see this one's like a little bit wet. It like could be sweat or nectar or who knows what's on here. Um, lots of like propolis stuck to these usually. Um, we had a couple that had holes burned through them because people sat the smoker on top of the data sheet. So um, you could always kind of tell how hard or easy of a day the beekeeper had, um, you know, especially by the ferocity of their handwriting. Sometimes in the particular observation, it says like aggressive hive and you can tell their, their handwriting is like a little frantic because um, they're not having a very good time. So um, yeah, always sort of interesting to get these data sheets. But basically what's really cool about this is every single thing that's recorded on this data sheet um, we would enter into a database and it would all be generated into a report. Um, and so the reports include your diagnostic results with your colonies Varroa and Nosema loads. Um, and they also record um, all this information that you put on your data sheet. So basically at the end of the season, you have this really thorough record of everything that happened in those hives over the whole season. And so, you know, this is a great sort of teaching tool for new beekeepers, but even beekeepers who had been doing it for a little while, for a few years or so, 
um, but kept feeling like they were getting caught by surprise when things would go wrong or when mite loads would spike up um, or anything like that. The consistency of doing the same thing month after month, I think is really helpful for people. And then the other kind of cool thing about this is um, we share the Varroa and Nosema data um, anonymously on the Be Informed sort of data explorer thing. And um, I like to do this over Zoom because I can. We can actually just do a separate screen share here and I can show you live what the data explorer looks like. Um, so this is the Be Informed Partnership website. You can see it's bib2.beinformed.org slash sentinel. And this is for 2022. So these are the current results from the um, Sentinel apiaries that are currently submitting samples this year. And this is pretty typical. You can see that um, the apiaries in the south, their mite loads start to spike a little bit earlier in the season compared to us beekeepers further north who have a little bit more of a brood break, a little bit of a later start. Um, I'm in Washington, so we can click on Washington State. You can see there's Sentinel apiaries in two counties here in Washington State. We can actually click on both the counties and it will show you, um, you know, the varroa loads for the samples they've submitted so far. So both those Sentinel apiaries have really low mite loads so far. And so the idea here, and you can see the nosema too, this probably means that there was no nosema detected um, in the other sample submitted. Um, and so it's pretty cool because, you know, if I'm a beekeeper in one of those counties, I can sort of compare, um, you know, how the Sentinel apiary looks compared to uh, how my bees are looking or if I haven't sampled my bees yet and I see, you know, my neighbor in my county is having a high mite load already, it's kind of like, oh shoot, like I better go check out what's going on in my hives. Um, so the idea is to kind of build up this community of beekeepers um, where we can all sort of share information. So um, I think the Data Explorer is pretty cool. There's lots of other stuff um, on here too. There's like other survey results. Um, so again, just trying to share as much of this data um, in real time as possible. I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. The program um, and you know what's cool about this is it's also generating a lot of really valuable data right so from 2017 to 2019 um, these are the, the three years that I was actually in charge of administrating this program during my PhD um, so where I was receiving all those data sheets and entering all that information there were 227 sentinel apiaries in all these different states across the U.S. I think it's about 30 states or so um, and so what that comes out to is over 200 beekeepers sampling over 1300 colonies. And so about 8,000 samples processed for Varroa and Nesema. So um, really this is a pretty large amount of data that we can start to use to try to answer some questions. And it's also a pretty unique data set because it's the same colonies monitored over an entire season, right? It, that's that longitudinal data um, where you can really look at the trends of how things are changing over time. And you can look at the management practices that these beekeepers use and the outcomes that happen to their colonies and sort of see um, what these management practices really look like uh, in real apiaries. And so, you know, one of the biggest things everyone always asks us about and talks about and is worried about is mites and mite treatments. Um, and people have lots of questions about which mite treatments to use, um, how well different things work, what, you know, what we use, what they should use, um, all different kinds of things. And one of the things we hear relatively often is like, oh, well, I treated with whatever product and it didn't work. You know, my mite load was still really high after I applied that treatment. And so we wanted to look into that and see how often that was happening because our expectations of these products are pretty high, right? We have um, high expectations that the products will be really effective. And part of the reason for that is because um, on the label and in other materials, it'll say 
you know, this product has 95% efficacy against mites or 98% efficacy against mites. And so we expect to apply these products and kill virtually all of the mites in our colonies. So, you know, here's sort of a hypothetical example of an apiary's mite load from May to October. So, you know, you can think about starting in the spring with a relatively low mite load. Maybe those are new colonies or overwintered colonies that were relatively healthy last year. This is pretty typical where you'll kind of have a slow creep up um, over the summer. And then um, usually right around this time of year in late summer, early fall, we'll sort of have a spike um, in mite loads. You know, this is exceeding that recommended treatment threshold of three mites per hundred bees here. And then um, once our mite load spikes, and hopefully we know it spiked because we've been monitoring our apiaries very well and we know what our mite loads are. Um, after that spike happens, we apply a treatment and we expect that our mite load will go down and it'll go down below that treatment threshold of three mites per hundred bees. We really expect it'll go down pretty close to zero. Um, we, we really hope there will be very few mites left in our colonies after we apply these treatments. And so um, one of the first things we just wanted to look at is how often is this really the situation? How often is the mite load going down after we apply these treatments? And so what we found was kind of scary and surprising. So in those, um, you know, 227 sentinel apiaries over these three years, there were 278 records of mite treatments being applied. And in 201 of those cases, or about 72% of the time, the mite load was actually higher the month after that treatment was applied. So say the beekeeper applied a treatment in August, when they went back to take their sample in September, the mite load was actually higher in September than it had been in August. So our expectation that we put that treatment on and our mite load immediately drops to zero or goes down almost to nothing um, was not holding up <laughs> in these sentinel apiaries. Only about 28% of the time did the mite load actually decrease uh, in the month following a treatment application. Um, and so you know, this was surprising and a little bit worrisome. Um, so, you know, we wanted to look a little bit more closely at it and look at if treatments were helping at all. And so to do that, we can kind of look at the rate of change of these mite loads from month to month. And so, um, you know, here we're just comparing on the x-axis our pre-treatment varroa load, so our, our mite load before we apply a treatment. And then on the x-axis, this is our post-treatment varroa load, so our mite load um, the month after we applied that treatment. And so this here is just showing May and June. So, you know, again, this is saying that at the May sampling event, that beekeeper had not applied a treatment yet. Um, sometime in between the May and June sample, they apply a mite treatment. And then at the June sample, after that treatment was applied, what was the mite load? And so these lines kind of show us the change in mite load um, before and after the treatment was applied. And so um, what we can do is we comp can compare uh, apiaries that were not treated between May and June in orange here. So again, these apiaries did not receive a mite treatment between May and June to apiaries that were treated between May and June. So that's the green line. And you can see that the green line is a little bit flatter than the orange line, right? And so and there's a lot of variation here, as there always is with sort of everything bee related, there's lots of variation. Um, but you can see that in general, and this is actually a statistically significant difference, this green line is a little bit flatter than the orange line, which means the mite loads did not increase as quickly uh, in treated apiaries as they did in untreated apiaries. So that makes sense, right? We ex it makes sense that um, in apiaries that got a mite treatment, their mite loads didn't increase as much, increased at a slower rate. And so then we can do that same thing for all the months of the season. Um, and so, you know, June, July, July, August. And what you'll kind of notice is that as we move through the season, um, the orange lines start to get a little bit steeper and the green lines stay about the same. And so by the time we get to 
the fall here, the in between September and October, you can see that um, apiaries that were not treated between September and October are having really fast increases in mite loads. Their mite loads are going up a lot in that month period um, compared to um, apiaries that were treated between September and October. So um, even though this is still, you know, a slightly positive line, a slightly increase in the mite load, um, it's much better than the alternative of not treating at all. Um, and that mite load is like skyrocketing, right? So the mite loads are technically still increasing after we're applying treatments, but they are increasing at a much slower rate. So kind of um, slowing down the mite population growth in our apiaries, um, even if we're not knocking it down to zero as much as we would have expected. Um, and so I think, you know, the takeaway here is just maybe to kind of adjust your expectations of our mite treatments a little bit um, and to really realize that prevention is really critical. Because if we're talking about slowing the increase or sort of flattening this curve, not to bring back a, you know, COVID reference from two years ago, but that is kind of an appropriate description of what we're trying to do here. The earlier we try to uh, flatten this curve, the better, right? And so this is just sort of a hypothetical graph from the Honeybee Health Coalition of how mite populations fluctuate over the season compared to bee populations, right? We start in the spring, low populations on both ends. And then as that bee population starts to slowly increase over the season, the mite population is increasing too. As they're producing more brood, there's more space for the mites to reproduce. And so, you know, you can imagine that if we're not applying any treatments, uh, the rate of increase in the mite populations sort of follows the path of this red line, right? Pretty fast increase. But if we do uh, apply a treatment at this juncture, kind of earlier in the spring, or maybe right before we put our honey supers on, something like that, um, and we slow the increase in that mite population growth earlier, that peak is not going to be as tall by the time we get to fall, right? So you can kind of cut that off much earlier in the season than if you wait um, to do anything about it until this time of year. Whereas, you know, you can still um, flatten your curve a little bit back here, but that population peak is still going to be higher than if you had started earlier. And so, you know, I A personal anecdotal opinion of mite treatments too, that a lot of them work really well if you use them when your mite load's relatively low. And so um, especially like some of these longer term treatments, a six week treatment, something like that, that sort of has a slower release of the active ingredient, um, seems like they work really well to keep the mite load low. But if you already have a high mite load, they are not as good as knocking that mite load all the way down to zero. Um, and so really important to be proactive about these kind of things. Um, and so, you know, we do kind of want to come back to why is this happening, right? We are using all these mite treatments um, and the treatments are keeping the mite load lower, but we're still above that threshold of three mites per hundred bees on average in the fall. So again, this is from data from all those sentinel apiaries and we have recently treated apiaries in green and untreated apiaries in orange. Um, and you can see that, and the red line here is that three mites per hundred bees threshold. You can see that untreated apiaries exceed that threshold earlier and have higher mite loads on average. But even though, you know, these apiaries here in October in this green bar were just treated the following, the pre previous month, you know, they just had a treatment applied in September, say, um, they're still above that threshold in the fall. And so, um, why are these treatments not giving us the expected results, especially in the fall, right? It seems to be um, especially severe in the fall. And so, you know, the thing we kind of kept coming back to is this idea of the horizontal transmission of mites. And so what we're talking about here with horizontal transmission is the spread of mites um, between apiaries, between colonies and between apiaries. So. Um, you know, this is sort of referred to as the mite bomb phenomenon. Um, you know, a lot of mechanisms for this sort of re revolve around robbing where um, bees are just 
mixing quite a bit throughout the landscape. They're visiting their neighboring colonies a lot and they bring mites with them when they do that. And so um, our thought was that this phenomenon might be part of the reason why um, these treatments in the fall aren't knocking our mite loads down as low as we think because they might be getting re continuously reinfested from bees visiting from other apiaries and other colonies. Um, and if everyone's not treating at the same time or having a low mite load all season, and you know, if everyone doesn't have a high mite load in the fall, we might just be continually reinfesting each other. And so, um, you know, I wanted to just kind of test whether uh, visitation from bees from high mite colonies was associated uh, with increases in mite loads. And so um, this is hard to do because it involves tracking individual bees moving between colonies and between apiaries. So it involves marking a lot of bees and trying to detect and find all those bees um, in different apiaries. And so um, uh, studies that have done this prior um, typically use like a pretty small number of colonies, like six or so colonies um, and maybe just a small number of apiaries. So we wanted to try to do this at sort of a more realistic scale with more apiaries and more colonies. Um, and we also wanted to test a possible intervention for this, which comes in the form of a robbing screen. Um, and you know, you're all beekeepers, so you know what this is. This is you know what a robbing screen is, but I'll just explain um, sort of our thought process behind this. And so you know, the way this works is that the expected colony entrance is down here. You can see into where the normal entrance for that colony is. And all the smells and sounds um, of a normal colony entrance are still allowed to pass through this screen. But the actual colony entrance is this little reduced entrance that's hidden at the top of the screen up here. And so the idea is that bees that did not originate from this colony will go for that expected entrance and they either won't ever find the actual colony entrance or even if they do figure out that they're supposed to try to go in there, um, they are not gonna be as able to get in because this is a very you know small reduced entrance. It's harder to find. It's easier for this colony to guard and keep unwanted bees um, out of this colony. And so the idea here is that um, if bees are visiting or robbing from other nearby colonies and they are trying to gain access to a new colony to rob it. Uh, the robbing screen will sort of interrupt this phenomenon and will keep this receiver colony safe um, from these visiting bees. So this receiver colony will be able to reject these non-natal visiting bees from entering the colony. And so the thought here is that colonies that have robbing screens on them should have lower increases in mite loads than unscreened colonies, right? That an unscreened colony is just totally vulnerable. It's like a free for all, anybody can come and go. So um, we wanted to test this idea that the robbing screen might kind of help protect your colonies and slow this down. Um, and we'll see what happened. Um, and so again, to do this, I wanted to use relatively large amount of colonies um, and a relatively large amount of apiaries. And so we set up this big study at one of our research farms at the University of Maryland. And so, you know, here this yellow dot in the center is what I call the donor apiary. And then surrounded by that donor apiary are eight receiver apiaries. And what I've tried to do here is have um, a receiver apiary. This is about a half a mile from the center and about one mile from the center. We tried to roughly go in the cardinal directions around that donor apiary. Um, the shape of the farm kind of constricted us to this, um, not exactly cardinal directions, but um, in that donor apiary, there were four colonies. There were two colonies that had very high mite loads. So mite loads greater than five mites per hundred bees. One of them had a mite load of like 12 mites per hundred bees. It was like a very high mite load. And then right next to them in the same apiary, we had two low mite colonies that had mite loads less than one mite per hundred bees. And so the idea here is to sort of compare um, the movement of these bees from the high and low mite colonies and see if 
Um, more hymite bees are ending up in receiver apiaries. And if that is associated with bigger increases in mite loads um, than colonies that were just visited by bees from the low mite colonies. And in order to tell whether the bees came from high or low mite donor colonies, we had to paint a lot of bees, right? So um, those two high mite colonies, we tried to mark virtually all of the bees in that colony with a red pen. Um, this is actually my husband in this video who I dragged out here on a Saturday um, and forced him to help me paint all these bees. <laughs> and so to do this, um, we just, the colony was in um, a deep and a medium and we would shake all the frames into a plastic tote with a lid. And then we would remove about 500 bees at a time um, from that plastic tote and we would anesthetize them with carbon dioxide. And the CO2 makes them pass out and they're passed out just for a few seconds for less than 10 seconds. And we'd spread them out on, this is just the back of like um, an IPM sticky board that comes with a screen bottom board. Um, we'd spread them out on that. And then they're actually hard to paint while they're unconscious because um, they're on their backs. But as soon as they start to come to, they flip over and they just kind of hold still and stand there because they're a little bit dazed. Um, and so they, hold relatively still enough, long enough for us to paint as many as we can. And so, um, you know, we painted uh, about, I think, 8,000 bees in each colony. Um, and so the high mite colonies were painted red and the low mite colonies were painted blue. Um, and then in the receiver apiaries, we also had four colonies each um, and each receiver colony had a camera placed on it. And so um, the cameras are these little um, like computer motherboards. They're super cheap. It's called a Raspberry Pi. People use them for like all sorts of different little home projects. They're like, you can get them for like 20 bucks a piece. Um, and those computers have a little camera module attached. And we taught the computers to recognize the red and blue paint colors we had used. And so every time a painted bee passed underneath one of those cameras, which was perched right above the entrance of each receiver colony. So every time a painted bee passed, you know, near the entrance of one of those colonies, um, the computer would take a picture. And so we had a photographic record of every time. So, you know, this way we could sort of track um, where those donor bees were going, how frequently they were getting there. Um, and this was much more feasible than searching manually by hand, going through every single colony, um, actually pulling out every frame looking for painted bees because we had tried that. <laughs> um, and as you might imagine, the recovery rate is pretty low because you just, it's like a needle in a haystack. It's really hard to search manually and you're likely to miss things, right? You have to, your timing has to be spot on in order to be there at the same time as a painted bee. So the cameras could run, you know, all day from sunup to sundown um, and make sure we didn't miss anything. And we were also able to tell individual painted bees apart because as you can imagine, when you're painting that many individuals, you're not as careful as you might be if you were marking like your queen or, you know, very prized bee. Um, when we were trying to do it that quickly, we weren't necessarily that accurate. And so this is an example of a picture that was taken by one of those cameras. So this is a blue donor bee that's ended up um, in a receiver apiary. Um, and you can see this one's little paint mark is pretty nice. Um, and then if you compare it to this one, you can see those are clearly two different individuals, right? Because this one's got like a little heart-shaped mark on her thorax. Um, so it's, it's very clear that those are two separate individuals and we can definitively say that's two separate visitations. Um, this poor individual <laughs> got some on her thorax and some on her eyes, um, but she, you know, apparently could still fly and navigate because she did still make it to this receiver apiary. So, um, you know, again, clearly another unique individual. And so, um, you know, we also then, of course, had red uh, painted bees as well. But because um, our marking was not that precise, it enabled us to sort of have unique identifiers on each of these bees, which was really cool. Um, and so, and then um, 
for the robbing screens, um, we also screened two out of the four colonies in each of the receiver apiaries. And so, you know, again, um, this was to sort of test that possible intervention of the robbing screen. And so once we were all set up, our receiver apiaries looked like this, um, where we had four colonies just in single deeps. Um, the little camera modules are mounted over the entrance um, of each colony. And then um, we have screens on two of those colonies. And so I can just jump right into um, what we found. And so again, the first thing we wanted to look at was just how many donor bees were ending up in these receiver apiaries and how many of them came from high mite colonies compared to low mite colonies. Um, and those low mite colonies, we know they remained with low mite loads because we took samples to confirm it, but also they were kind of receiving formic acid. Um, they got treated with formic acid right before we started and then again um, three weeks after we started to make sure that their mite load stayed low throughout the study. Um, and the original idea was to do this until those high mite colonies collapsed, until they like totally crashed because their mite loads were so high. And when we had that one colony that had like 12 mites per 100 bees, I was like, cool, this is going to be done super fast. We'll be like out of here in a week or two because um, these bees are not going to last very long. Um, and of course, those colonies lasted and lasted and lasted and lasted. And this ended up going, I can't remember the exact length, but it was, I think it was close to like three months until it got too cold. We started this in September and we didn't end until November. So then it kind of got too cold and they weren't really flying anymore. And that's when we shut it down. So um, yeah, it just, whenever you actually want the bees to die quickly, they never do. And then when you need them to be healthy and survive a long time, they die immediately. It's, it's always fun. Um, so I'm just going to show you sort of how many donor bees we found in each place. You can see that most of the visits we found were at those closer apiaries, um, at these apiaries that were about a mile from the center. Um, we only found one visitor down here at this one. And you can also see that more uh, of the bees that made it to the receiver apiaries came from low mite colonies. So um, and we only had 47 detections of donor bees total, which when I told you we painted 8,000 bees per donor colony, it's a very low recovery rate. But um, I didn't know if we were going to find any. So I was actually pretty happy with 47. That's a pretty good sample size in terms of uh, statistical analyses and things like that. So um, I was happy to find 47. 80% um, of those visits came from low mite donor bees. Um, so only about 20% came from um, bees from high mite colonies. And so, um, you know, then we also looked at just the colonies that were visited by high mite donor bees, even though there was a really small number of visits. Um, and this is just looking at the percent change in mite load in those colonies over the period of the study. And so in gray here, we have colonies that were not visited by those red painted bees from those high mite colonies. And in um, red, these colonies were visited by those high mite bees. And you can see there's no significant difference in their change in mite load. The mite load went up um, pretty significantly in both groups, um, but no significant difference, which makes sense, right? With such a small number of visits um, from those high mite donor bees, I would be surprised if it seemed to have that big of an impact um, on the receiver colony mite load. Um, but then we looked at the percent change in mite load um, over the length of the study in colonies that were visited by any donor bee. And so in purple here, these are colonies that were visited by blue or red bees. So any painted bee ended up in those colonies um, compared to in gray here, we have uh, colonies that were never visited by any donor bee. And so you can see that colonies that were visited um, have a much higher increase in mite load than colonies that weren't visited at all. And so it seems like maybe there's something to, um, you know, how frequently a colony is being visited by bees in general these colonies that are never being visited by donor bees um, seem to be a little bit more protected than these ones that are receiving a lot of visitors. 
And then when we look at the robbing screens, we also see that screen colonies had smaller increases in mite loads. And so in this lighter gray color here is colonies that had robbing screens compared to unscreen colonies. And you can, say, you can see that they did have a smaller increase in mite load, um, the colonies that did have robbing screens. And so again, seems like maybe colonies that are a little bit better protected and receiving fewer visitors um, do have smaller increases in mite loads. Um, and this is also just to show that visited colonies that were visited um, also had a higher mite load at the beginning of the study. And so um, this is just the starting mite load of these colonies. And so colonies that would never be visited by any, visit any visitor bees um, started the study with a lower mite load than colonies that would end up being visited. And so, you know, we, we kind of took this to mean that um, colonies that have higher mite loads to begin with might be a little bit weaker, might be a little bit smaller in population size, um, a little bit less capable of defending themselves, um, might have viruses. You know, other studies have shown that certain viruses make colonies more susceptible to allowing visitors. And so um, these varroa vectored viruses actually might make colonies more willing to accept more visitors and get more mites. And so again, seems like there might just be something about how well a colony is able to protect itself from visitors um, or from robbers that um, is indicative of how their mite loads will change. And so, you know, just to sort of sum up, um, we do think that the increases in mite loads were associated with non-natal bee visitation, not just from high mite colonies, but probably from everybody, right? So, um, you know, we have high mite colonies, we have low mite colonies, we have other receiver colonies, we have, you know, this wasn't an isolated area, so there's also other beekeepers around, we have other people's bees, um, all sort of mixing around in the landscape uh, and visiting receiver colonies. And we think that, you know, regardless of the source of those bees, of the source of those visiting robbing bees, how often a colony is visited in general seems to be associated with how much their mite load goes up. And so, you know, what this kind of points to is that the permissiveness of the receiver colonies to accept visitors might be pretty important. Um, and so again, you know, weaker colonies or unscreened colonies, colonies that were less able to protect themselves had higher increases in mite loads. And so, you know, and you know, also when you think about how these apiaries were set up, we had two screen colonies and two unscreen colonies in each yard. And so if I'm a robber and I to an apiary and I first come across a really strong, healthy hive that's really capable of defending itself against intruders, um, or I come across a hive with a robbing screen, and for some reason it's very difficult for me to gain access to that colony, I'm just gonna go next door. I'm gonna see if I have an easier time over there. Maybe I'll run into a weaker colony, an unhealthy colony, or just a colony that doesn't have a screen on it, and I'm just gonna scoot right in. It's gonna be a lot easier. And so it seems like, you know, the willingness or permissiveness of these colonies to receive um, visitors is probably an important factor, maybe more so than the source of where these bees are coming from. And it seems like robbing screens might help. There's more work to be done here. You know, again, we're not sure if this would work as well if, um, every colony in the apiary were screened, um, then the bees might just have to be a little more persistent. They might gain access anyway, but um, you know, it might be something interesting to try, especially once the honey flows over, um, which is you know, starting to happen for us here uh, in Pullman. And then, um, you know, I also just like to sort of mention this has sort of interesting implications for bee breeding, right? We all really like to work with and breed and purchase really nice, gentle bees, right? Like that's where the fun in beekeeping, it's not fun to work aggressive colonies or really defensive colonies, I should say. Um, but we sort of, there's sort of evidence that these more defensive strains um, tend to have fewer mite issues. And some of that's related to how frequently they swarm or they just keep a smaller brood nest in general, or they have a lot of brood breaks. Um, but it is sort of something interesting to think about, you know, I've heard lots of anecdotal stories from people whose most defensive colonies, like, never have to be treated for mites because they always have a really low mite load. So, 
it's sort of interesting to think of a defensive colony as keeping out robbers more effectively. Um, and so they might have fewer fall mite issues if they're really good at doing that. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that this whole study is published open access um, in scientific reports. And so you can Google it and anybody should be able to find the full copy of the study um, for free. So if you're interested in reading more. Um, and yeah, I think with that, I will thank um, all the funders who help support this work. A lot of this work was funded by beekeeping organizations, which we're super grateful for. Um, and all our collaborating universities and the Bee Informed Partnership, um, everyone at University of Maryland who helped with this. This is like the whole lab and crew back in Maryland. Um, this again is my husband who I dragged out here to help me. Um, so yeah, he's getting his master's now um, here at Washington State. So now the tables have turned a little bit and I'm the one helping him with his field work so I can pay him back, but yeah. Um, this is my email address here at WSU. Um, if anyone has any questions for me that they want to ask later, um, but I think, or just wants to get in contact for any reason at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but I will take some questions now as well. Thank you so much, Kelly. That, that was awesome. Um, and for starting off too with a real, uh, you know, in-depth overview of the Sentinel Apiary program, because I think, um, you know, when people can see what all is sort of involved and kind of how it, how it gets synthesized into the bigger picture, you know, sometimes we just look at our backyard and we think we're in our own little bubble, you know, we don't realize what that looks like comparatively. And so it's really nice to be able to, to take a, a sort of bird's eye view of things and then see what that means, especially over the over the region and over the country. And, and I, I apologize too, because I got nervous and I realized I didn't actually read your bio and so, <laughs> as I meant to, but you did, you did a wonderful introduction of yourself. But I, one of the things that I really wanted to highlight is that, um, you know, you're now with your new position at WSU, which congratulations, that's really awesome. Um, is that you plan to build a program based on regular communication with stakeholders and to address needs such as locally specific best practices for bee management and crop pollination and extension programs that will put the latest research into the hands of stakeholders. And I, I really, um, I applaud that. I really admire that because I think that's one of the sort of, um, you know, unfortunate disconnects sometimes that have happened, you know, I definitely historically, but I think we're seeing a real shift in um, in those relationships between those in the field, whether they're hobbyists or commercial folks, and those who are in the labs and and working with research institutions. And there's so much that we can we can learn and do together. So that's that's awesome. I really think that's great. So yeah, we can open it up for um, for some questions, and I'll I'll go into the Q and A. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A because then it keeps it um, in an orderly fashion for us to, to read through. Um, and also feel free to use the chat. You can let us know where you're um, beaming in from this evening or joining us this evening from. But our first question comes from Doug um, or Rush. I don't know what's his first name or his last name, sorry. <laughs> um, but he asks, how are you treating with extreme temperatures? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and, you know, of course, a lot of our treatments that are available have really strict um, temperature ceilings. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't recommend like using formic acid or anything like that <laughs> this time of year. It's too hot. Um, and yeah, that's actually a good question. I don't know. Um, I think we're doing oxalic acid drips right now. Um, and I'm not actually 100% sure what the temperature range is on an oxalic acid drip or if there is one. Um, but, you know, we, I, we have not seen any negative. And there's a lot of brood present right now. So that's also like probably not the best application for that. We're going to have to repeat treatments multiple times to make sure we have okay coverage. Um, but yeah, I think we're doing oxalic acid drip right now. I think Apivar you can do once you pull your honey supers off with relatively higher temps. Um, 
yeah, does anyone else have any suggestions? Feel free to put it in the chat if you're dealing with high temperatures, um, how you're treating, because it is tricky. You know, that's the hard thing with formic acid is like, oh, you can use it with Superzon, but it's usually too hot when you're super <laughs> When um, they're curing honey, it's a lot, <laughs> a <yeah>. lot warmer. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I would say too, I mean, like when we look at these, um, you know, these different sort of weather extremes that are going on and, you know, it's good to have that a very toolkit, so to speak, you know, so that depending on what's going on in your area. Um, and I, I, I have a feeling that's going to get trickier and trickier for, for all of us, um, no matter where we're located, but. Um, okay, our next question comes from Christina Williams. How likely is it that foragers carry Varroa? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that some people have looked into the proportion of foragers that are coming back with mites. And so Gloria DeGrandy Hoffman, I know, has a good paper looking at, I think, like, the proportion of foragers with mites is in the title. And she basically looked at the entrance of colonies and picked bees that were returning to colonies um, and counted like the number of mites that they were bringing back with them. So there has been some work done on sort of the frequency of that. That's one of the big questions I have about our study is that, you know, we only detected 47 donor bees in those receiver apiaries. And so, you know, how much of an impact is 47 bees really gonna have on the mite load? Um, and I think one of the things we're actually hoping to do in the future is to track the actual individual mites moving between colonies rather than the bees and sort of get a really more detailed picture on um, how the actual mites are moving between colonies. Because right now, most people just use bees as sort of a proxy. We see lots of bees moving. Here's how the mite load changes. Um, so mites must be moving also. Um, but I think it'll be really cool to try and look at um, the actual mites moving. And there's different like molecular techniques that can be used to do that. I'm no expert there, but there's other professors at WSU here who do mite research using those techniques that are going to help us. Um, so that's something we're hoping to look at. But I think. Um, there's also interest in, you know, mites like to spend a lot of time on nurse bees so they can hop into brood cells and reproduce. Um, but they do spend time on foragers. Um, and so the interest there is sort of, are they doing that intentionally to help propagate themselves to other colonies? You know, can they tell this is a forager um, and I'm gonna hop on this one so I can get a ride out of here and go to a different host. And so, um, yeah, just lots of, more interesting stuff to look into for sure. Awesome, thank you. And yeah, the, the article's posted there. So um, those who are interested in checking it out. Um, here's, a, here's a good question. I know there's some research out about some particular products, um, but this is from Ken who's asking, are there treatments that mites are getting um, immunity to? I guess building, um, a tolerance to is maybe one way to say it as well. Yeah, sure. Good question. Um, so kumaphos and fluvalinate are two active ingredients that have well documented, documented resistance um, and kind of stopped working, you know, in the 90s um, against bites. And so um, those have sort of fallen out of favor. I think a lot of beekeepers don't use them anymore. There has been more recent evidence that kind of showed that people stopped using them for so long that they are effective again. Um, we used fluvalinate, um, which I think, I never remember the commercial name of it, Apa Life Bar maybe. Um, but the active ingredients fluvalinate, it's, I think it's the only mite treatment you can get with fluvalinate in it. We used it for a study um, as like a positive control last year um, and it did not work for us. <laughs> so I'll say that. Um, and then in terms of amitraz, which is incredibly widely used, um, there is just now starting to be some documented resistance to amitraz. And so that's very concerning. Um, you know, that's one of our most frequently used products um, and active ingredients, especially among commercial operations is amitraz. 
And so um, everybody's really worried about um, the development of resistance to that. And so, you know, as Melanie mentioned, like this idea of a toolkit where we have lots of different things to rotate between is super important because um, if you're changing active ingredients, you're putting different pressure on the mites each time. And so you're much less likely to develop resistance. So we really recommend that people try to use lots of different products and not just be using the same thing every time. Um, Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see here. We have, there's a few questions there that I'll let you just answer maybe to type back to them because it. Um, I want to make sure we build in some time for a bio break and and give Nuria, um, Dr. Morphin, a, um, a, enough time as well. But um, one, one question here that um, we can sort of end with uh, with for you, Kelly, is from Brian. He was asking, was there any correlation between the ending overall size or strength of the hive and the ending mite loads? Yeah, great question. So um, the actual frames of bees um, stayed the same in all the receiver colonies. Um, and I should have mentioned, so I think I showed in the picture, they were all, the receiver colonies were all in single deeps. Um, those were all new splits that we had made in August specifically for this experiment. So um, all new splits with, you know, sister queens from the same source to sort of make sure that everybody started on the same playing field in those receiver colonies. Um, and so, um, you know, they all started at the same colony size frames of bees and they all were still relatively the same at the end. Um, the, yeah, and the donor colonies, um, the high mite colonies did sort of dwindle in size over the experiment, really just in like the last couple of weeks or so, they really sort of tanked in size, but they didn't actually ever fully die. Um, and so, um, you know, that was kind of one thought, maybe we saw fewer high mite bees because there was just a smaller population, but that really didn't happen until the last couple of weeks of the study um, when we weren't seeing that many visiting bees anyway. So a lot of those visitations happened earlier in the study when the colonies were similar in size. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And if you have a moment, I don't know if you have some more time to spend with us, but um, there's a few more questions in the Q&A and maybe you can type in a response. Yes, uh, I will, for sure. And yeah. Like you said, um, anyone can feel free to email me. Um, there's more later. There we go. Awesome. Excellent. Well, cool. Thank you. That was, that was great. Second introduction for Dr. Um, Dr. Morphine. And um, she's the tech transfer program lead in British Columbia and has been working with honeybees for 15 years as an extensionist beekeeper and researcher. Um, and she got her PhD from the University of Guelph, the Honeybee Center, um, where she later worked as a researcher studying the impact of stressors on health and behavior, analyzing the mechanisms behind behavioral immunity, and studying the lipidome and meta metabolome <laughs> profile of bees. Nuria also worked as a bee inspector for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs, and throughout her career, she has been actively contributing to apicultural research and the beekeeping industry. So thanks so much for joining us, and this is cool. We'll get a We'll get a um, you know another sort of country bird's eye view of um, of of your program. So this is fantastic. Go ahead, Nuria. Floor is oh, yours. Thank you, thank you, Melanie, and and thank you for the introduction and also for the invitation. And thank you to uh, the panelists that are here and everyone that has stayed for for the presentation. So I think this one is going to be very easy because uh, Kelly gave all the, inform the the first part of the presentation. So I think this is gonna go very, very smoothly, hopefully. So I'm gonna be talking about integrated pest management and how we can strengthen this uh, strategy to control varroa structure through genetics. Uh, so that is uh, basically the approach that I'm gonna take, but it's gonna be, uh, I'm gonna have a, a, a an overview of IPM and why we use it for varroa, for varroa mites. And just as a very brief introduction, I, I thought about starting with um, what, is, what are these technology transfer programs that I think is very similar to being for partnership, just like um, Melanie was mentioning, 
but we have uh, certain differences. So uh, just in general, these TTPs or in some provinces are knowledge transfer programs, are, we are the link between research uh, and the beekeeping industry. So uh, we identify technical innovations or new discoveries that can be applied to the beekeeping industries to support the, the beekeepers. And the opposite, we work very closely with beekeepers, identify their, the challenges that they are having, and we bring that information back to research. And as we know, the beekeeping industry is currently facing, or I guess always, has faced different challenges just because it's a dynamic industry. There are changes in market, in economy, new pests and diseases, environmental stressors. So all these um, changing situations um, required a, a lot of support for, for the beekeepers and we are here to be that link. Uh, in another linear way, we're here also to support um, applied research and facilitate the commercial application of some products, just like in other areas or other fields um, have been doing it for, for many years, including agriculture, biotechnology, medicine, and not to bring the topic back, for, but for a certain vaccine, there were uh, record-breaking uh, contracts of the technology transfer to uh, make the, the products available to the public faster to speed that process. So we do, do that as well. In other words, we are in charge of conducting applied research. We have an active communication with stakeholders. We, have, we uh, like to be hands-on. We work with beekeepers uh, on workshops, extension work, networking. So I like to think that we uh, speak both languages, um, the research and also the industry. And also I have to mention that uh, the Programs are different depending on the province. All the provinces have different needs, uh, different scopes, and the beekeeping industry, it's bigger or smaller or, or just different. So they adjust to that. Um, and with that, I'm going to start um, the presentation on IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And I guess um, I'm going to focus on Varroa Destructor which I don't think uh, this ectoparasite needs uh, a lot of introduction. We know is one of the most damaging parasites that beekeepers have to face. Um, it was introduced in the Americas in the 90s and we know it's here to stay. It has caused severe damage to the beekeeping industry. At an individual level, it um, reduces the longevity of bees, causes immunosuppression, that means that the bees are unable to defend themselves against other diseases. It also acts as a vector for some viruses, such as the formwing virus. Um, at a colony level, it reduces honey production in temperate uh, climates. B uh, the colonies that are parasitized with varroa, they would produce 50% less honey, uh, honey sorry, uh, than treated bees, uh, colonies. And well, it's the main cause of overwinter colony mortality. Uh, there are some viruses that have been associated with a uh, varroa destructor. It doesn't mean that varroa necessarily acts as a vector, so it's the, it's the way of transmission, but possibly they are associated in an indirect way. For example, uh, immuno immunosuppressed bees are unable to defend themselves, they get infected, and we find more, more of these viruses. Varroa destructor is the only one so far, to the best of my knowledge, that has been confirmed to be a biological vector. Um, that didn't make sense. It's the only uh, virus that in which varroa destructor has been confirmed to be a biological vector. That means that the virus is able to replicate in the mite. Uh, so if you have varroa destructor in your colonies, uh, it's very possible that you will find high levels of the farm wing virus as well. Some of these viruses that have been linked directly or indirectly with varroa have very distinctive signs, such as triple wings for the farm wing virus, and we have black wings for virus, suckroot virus, but other ones are not very easy to identify or to differentiate. Um, so uh, we need lab techniques to confirm the presence of these viruses. 
And some of them have a significant impact on honeybee colonies. In some uh, literature review or articles, you will see this term, the bee parasitic mite syndrome. In this case, uh, honeybee colonies are highly parasitized with varroa structure. There's a, a decrease in, in the population of worker bees, so they cannot perform all the tasks that they need, such as foraging, cleaning, uh, bringing resources. So these colonies are weak. There are opportunistic diseases, including bacterial diseases like European fowl brood, and these colonies will collapse very quickly, eh, and most likely they will not make it through the, eh, for the next season. So as you can see, or as, as we all know, um, varroa structure is quite a challenge. I think beekeepers, we talk more about varroa than we do about honey or other things. And so varroa, like I mentioned, it came to the Americas in the 90s. We know it's here to stay. We're not going to be able to get rid of the mite, but we can control um, this pest. And one of the uh, one way to control the other structure is through an integrated pest management. Um, so what is IPM? Where will this concept came uh, started? Well, after the Green Revolution, <laughs> after the, the Second War, we have a boom in, in uh, chemicals that we were using to control pests um, and produce crops. And um, some researchers and some uh, biologists, agronomists, they um, pointed out that by using these chemicals um, or overusing these chemicals and using them prophylactically, that means to prevent, not really to treat the pests, uh, there we, were, we would face a, a number of risks including that the pests will create resistance to these chemicals uh, and we will not be uh, preventing us from controlling uh, them uh, and having a, a bigger problem. Uh, the other one would be related to pollution, polluting the soil, water, and also there was a risk uh, in the farmers that were applying these chemicals. Uh, so it was around the 60s, if I remember correctly, it was Rachel Carson that uh, started this conversation of how can we control pests without overusing these chemicals. So the idea is to find when these um, pests reach a level that can harm the crop enough that it will hurt the pocket or the economy of the farmers in terms of production. And that is called the, the economic threshold. So if, if we keep these pests under control uh, using different tools, we can avoid overusing chemicals to control these, uh, these insects or these pests. So this applies very well to the beekeeping industry in terms of varroa structure. Uh, it, we, we can use the same principles to control this mite. So integrated pest management has different components. The first one is awareness or education, which is exactly what we're all doing right now. It's knowing your enemy, knowing the, the organism that you're working with, which means uh, honeybees, but also the pest and everything about it. It's biology, how to control it, how it behaves, and also keeping us updated uh, just with uh, Kelly's presentation, I, I learned a lot. Uh, it made me reflect on some things that we're also doing or not doing. Uh, so we have to keep updating, researching, and connecting with other beekeepers and colleagues to, to educate ourselves. Um, and very briefly, uh, Varroa structure, it's completely associated with the development of honeybees. And perhaps you've seen this image and you, you're familiar with this, but this is a very brief reminder on how varroa mites work. So a female mite will introduce herself into a cell that it's about to be uncapped. When this, once the cell is capped and the bee starts its uh, pupal stage, the mite will lay one egg, which will be unfertilized. And this unfertilized egg will become a male. If there's no other mites in the cell, then the female mite will mate with her own son. And once she's fertilized, she will start laying eggs that will become females, fertilized eggs that will become females. 
And throughout the development of the worker bee, this female mite will be able to reproduce. And at the end, when the worker bee emerges from her cell, we will have approximately four, three to four adult mites that are ready to start the cycle again. So that's why we see this uh, increase in the population of mites that Kelly was mentioning in the, in the previous presentation. And then with drones is a little bit more dramatic because uh, their developmental stage lasts a little bit longer. So instead of three to four mites, we will have up to six mites that will be ready to start the reproduction cycle again. So as we see, and, uh, and if we understand how this works, then as beekeepers, we can implement the strategies to try to disrupt this cycle and try to prevent the mite from increasing its reproduction. And this brings us to this graphic that I'm sure you're all, we're all familiar with, but once the beekeeping season starts, we tend to forget and it's easy to miss, uh, miss the dates. And also beekeeping, it's a lot about seasonality and uh, changing uh, conditions. So it's good to keep in mind the calendar, but it's always good to keep uh, our eyes open for uh, differences uh, or slight differences in our season, such as longer springs, uh, hard winters, short winters that will influence these, uh, these curves. So as, as we are all familiar with, um, the adult bee population is low in the spring, then it will go up in the summer, all the forages move, movement, the bees, um, the colonies are strong. And then at the end of the summer, it will start to decline. These foragers will start to die and we will have the cluster of bees that will overwinter. And then for brood is, uh, it goes hand in hand. The highest peak of brood production will be when we have a lot of resources, which are nectar and pollen, which is the protein to rear the brood. And then the mites will follow this uh, increase or this development of, of, the, of the brood. So we'll have a, a slight increase in the summer and then a peak, they will reach the highest peak at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. So this is a critical time. If we let the varroa mites grow to, uh, to levels that will harm our colonies, we can be in serious problems, such as having lower honey production, weak colonies, or not having bees for the next season. So higher mortality. And this brings us to uh, these terms that are related to integrated pest management. I'm so sorry, I think there's a microphone that is um, open. If uh, perhaps we can uh, mute our microphones. But... Okay, can you hear me well? Can someone give me a sign that? Okay, well, I'll keep going. I Hopefully everything's good with the sound. Um, so uh, how do we treat, uh, it's, okay, so uh, two terms that are related to this integrated pest management that are used uh, widely in agriculture and that we're using them also for, uh, or translating those terms into a uh, varroa destructor. One of them is called um, economic threshold, which is the percentage of mites in which we need to take action and control that mite population to prevent the, uh, this uh, mite growth to reach what we call economic injury level. If they reach this economic injury level, that means that the colony will uh, collapse, will not make it uh, for the next season, or we won't have uh, enough production. So the idea um, is to know the levels of, that we have throughout the year and prevent these levels from reaching an uh, economic injury level. So basically know when we have, uh, we have to be concerned. Which brings us to the next aspect of integrated pest management, which is monitoring. So monitoring, monitoring there are different ways that we can um, monitor such as using sticky papers, which are placed in, in the screen bottom board of the, of the hives. We can also use sugar shakes or, or alcohol washes. Sorry. 
And with this, we can calculate the percentage of mites um, in 100 bees or the uh, number of mites fallen per day. Uh, just as a reference, in British Columbia, the, the economic threshold is uh, 3%. It can vary depending on the region. And there are conversations in Europe and other parts of North America about uh, the need of revising this economic threshold because things have changed since the introduction of baromites. Um, for example, different climate patterns, longer springs, et cetera. Uh, new viral variants that are affecting these, the, the effects of the parasites uh, or some treatments uh, not being as effective as they used to be. Uh, in some countries, for example, Mexico, I just learned that they revised this economic threshold and from 5%, now they are using 3.5%. Per and so the idea is to do everything that we can to prevent mites from reaching those levels that we don't want, that will hurt us uh, or, or, the, or, or the operation. Uh, so, and, and these uh, tools can be uh, cultural or, or mechanical methods, for example, which means anything that will disrupt the cycle of baromite. For example, um, by leaving drone frames, um, the mites will go inside the drone cells that they, which they prefer because of their, this long developmental time. And before they hatch, the beekeeper has to take it out from the, from the hive, kill the brood, freeze them, give the, the drone frames to the chickens, make sure the mites are dead, and then they can reintroduce the drone frame into the, into the colony and they repeat if, uh, as needed. Uh, requeening is a, is a good way, way of controlling or, or coding this developmental, uh, or this mite development in the colony, and uh, also dividing the colony, splitting, making nooks. Anything that will disrupt the, the cycle of mites will help to reduce their levels. Uh, so that is, um, that's uh, so, uh, this, uh, the first part of integrated pest management. And then we have another tool in this uh, uh, set of, of uh, strategies, which is genetics. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on this one today. And, um, be, and that is because genetics is the first line of defense that beekeepers have to uh, help their bees defend themselves against this parasite. There are many advantageous traits that we can select for, uh, including defense mechanisms. And this is uh, to our advantage because we can, for example, delay the time of treatment. Um, we, we can have an extra tool to help our bees defend themselves from the mites. And there are uh, different uh, programs uh, for selective breeding that have been proven to be proven to be very um, efficacious, including um, tra for tracheal mites. So just like a, uh, like a brief review on, on honeybee immunity and well, where these old genetic uh, tools come from. Um, honeybees are very interesting because we can see them as individuals and also as a colony, as a superorganism. So as individuals, honeybees have humoral and cellular uh, immune responses, and they will be able to defend themselves against um, bacteria, fungi, viruses. But as a colony, as a superorganism, they have also developed the, uh, some strategies or behavioral immune responses that can help them uh, control uh, diseases and parasites within the colony. And some of these social defense mechanisms that we know and that we have been able to define include grooming behavior, which can be divided into self-grooming, in which bees use their own legs and mandibles to remove parasites from their bodies, uh, such as varroa destructor or the tracheal mite. This uh, self-grooming has been described uh, well in other animal models, and there are some similarities like shared genes, for example, with mites. Then we have allo-grooming or social grooming in which bees, uh, they make a dance, a tremble dance uh, or grooming invitation dance, 
and they ask other nest mates to help them uh, remove parasites or particles from their bodies. Then there is hygienic behavior in which bees are able to identify dead or diseased or parasitized larvae and remove them from the colony, uh, controlling in this way the disease. Then uh, honeybees also use propolis, which are resins that they collect from the trees. They have some chemical components such as flavonoids that have antimicrobial properties. And in a study, um, they found that bees that tend to propolis they have uh, had lower levels of viruses and also a lower um, expression of immune-related genes. And so they were able to link these responses with um, individual um, aspects of, of bees. And then uh, there is the proposal of bee fever in which bees would be able to increase the temperature within the colony in the presence of a chalk root, which is a fungi, but it looks like we have to revise this and take a, a deeper look uh, on this behavioral response. Then there, there are others like absconding, in which bees, they just leave the colony, they cannot handle the infestation, it's too uh, contaminated, they leave the hive, they leave the nest, um, but that trait is not something that the beekeepers want to, to have or to breed for. So we're gonna uh, take it a little bit on, uh, well, well, we'll ignore them, that trait for this presentation. So um, hygienic behavior and a virus sensitive hygiene, which is a, a, a form of hygienic behavior, have been proven to be very uh, successful um, strategies that we can incorporate into breeding programs. Um, and this hygienic behavior, as I mentioned, it uh, helps control bacterial, fungal, and viral infections within the colonies. The good news is that the heritability, that means the variation that is due to the genes, um, it's medium, uh, so it is not super low, so that's good. That means that we have good chances of selecting for this trait. Uh, I believe there are some uh, researchers that even found 0.65 um, as, a, as an index. So that's, uh, that helps. <laughs> and there's also six to seven QTLs, which are parts of the DNA that have been associated with this behavior. Um, and for virus sensitive hygiene, they found two of these uh, QTLs or sections of the DNA linked to virus sensitive hygiene in particular. So this is good news because um, we need this genetic aspect to be able to select for these traits. And we also need to quantify the trait. Uh, one of the methods that is used for uh, quantifying hygienic behavior is by using liquid nitrogen. So they put these uh, metal uh, rings in the gum, they pour liquid nitrogen, they kill freeze the brood, and then uh, they reintroduce the, the frame into the colony. And depending on the protocol, for example, 24 hours after, they remove the, the frame and they count the number of cells that have been uncapped. And that is a way of measuring hygienic behavior and scoring our colonies for our um, selective breeding. And then um, the other trait that has proven to be or, or have um, um, some hope, no, I, I, won't, I won't say hope, that have some uh, strength <laughs> to be used in selective progr uh, programs is self-grooming behavior. Uh, and we know some things about self-grooming, although there is many things that we uh, still need to investigate, but we know that um, self-grooming is effective to restrain varroa population growth, which is the graph that we saw, how varroa growth can increase their numbers throughout the season. We also know that grooming intensity is important to control varroa destructor. So the bees that groom intensively, they are more likely to get rid of the mite. Um, and also there are genotypes that are better at grooming compared to others, just like Kelly was mentioning. <laughs> Some of these um, genotypes are also known for their more, uh, or yeah, more uh, defensive behavior, such as Africanized bees and Russian bees. So they are better at, at expressing grooming behavior compared to European strains. 
And there are genes that have been associated with grooming behavior, including neurexin. Uh, and so just like hygienic behavior, how could we measure grooming behavior to be able to score our colonies or our queens and be able to select what we want, the trait that we want? There are different uh, me uh, methods that we could use. One of them is through individual grooming assays in which bees are placed inside a petri dish. We put a varroamide or flower on top of them and then we uh, we see uh, when uh, the time that they, when they started to groom, if they, they groom lightly using one or two legs slowly or intensively using more than three legs with intense shakings. We also, uh, if we use a varroa mite, we can assess if they were able to successfully remove the mite from their bodies. However, uh, this method has, is effective for research purposes, but uh, in a beekeeping operation, it would, this would be very challenging and time consuming. But um, there are some other traits that have been linked to grooming behavior, such as mite population growth. So for this measurement, we take mite levels using, for example, alcohol wash or sticky papers. We take them in the spring, then 16, 16 weeks after, we subtract the number and we know the, how much the mites grew within a season. And if we use sticky papers, we can also look uh, under the microscope and see how many mites show signs of mutilations that are uh, very likely uh, done by the chewing or the, uh, the grooming or biting of the, of the honeybee on the mites. And we can also rank these mutilations and see how severe they are. So all these traits are linked to the, uh, the social defense mechanism of self-grooming. And we also have the potential of using molecular markers, for example, genes or other uh, uh, molecular markers that we can find in the DNA or other types such as proteins. In this video here, we can see a bee grooming intensively. You can see that she's using a lot of energy and she's using um, more than three legs to remove the flower that we use to, um, to trigger self-grooming instances. So there are uh, different aspects that we have, uh, or, or different uh, research groups that have been working on understanding self-grooming and how we can use that and incorporate uh, this trade into breeding programs and use it as an extra tool for uh, our integrated pest management. So in this, um, I'm gonna focus mainly on, on two research groups. Um, one of them was led by Dr. Greg Hunt at Purdue University. Now it's led by Dr. Uh, Brock Harper. And they work on the, uh, the Indiana mite mite biter bees. And they found um, an association between the proportion of chewed mites and the mites that were removed by grooming bees. So that is a li the link that we want so we can score this, um, this trait and be able to select for it. And then um, in another study done by Ernesto Guzman and Dr. Berna Emsen in, at the University of Guelph Honeybee Research Center, this study was interesting because they found the connection between um, the behavior of the colony and the individual behavior of bees. So they found that um, the bees that were taken from presumably resistant colonies um, groomed more intensively, had ve better chances of removing the mite from their bodies, and had lower mite levels and showed higher percentage of damaged mites. So this is an important study because the, it shows a link between uh, the individual behavior and the colony uh, phenotype. And then um, other study found uh, the gene that I was mentioning, neurexin, uh, associated with self-grooming uh, behavior. And later, uh, again at the Honeybee Research Center, where I, I worked uh, for some years, they also found that intense grooming bees showed, had higher levels of this same gene, neurexin. And Later on, in a, a, a collaboration between Indiana and, and Guelph, 
they will, uh, found also a correlation between this same gene, neurexin, and the proportion of mutilated mites. So it shows pr uh, promising results that we could potentially use um, genetics or markers to help the keepers uh, select for these traits, although we still need to understand uh, more. Uh, like in honeybees, nothing is simple. They are complex um, insects. So we still need to figure out a little bit more about the self-grooming. So going back to Purdue University, uh, this, uh, they started this program, the Indiana Mite Biter Stock, and they, they started in the 90s, and they focused mainly on the proportion and severity of mite mutilation. And they were selecting for bees that, uh, or colonies that showed a higher proportion of, of mite mutilation. Uh, in this image, we can see Crispin Givens assessing mites or scoring mites for the proportion of uh, chewed um, mites and the severity of these, of these markings. These uh, bites could also be related to other uh, things such as social grooming, for example, of, or just accidents that mites would have. However, this trait has been linked to self-grooming behavior. Um, this um, Indiana mite biter stock was evaluated twice one um, in 2014 and the other one in 2019. So this, the selected stock of Indiana mite biter bees was compared to European uh, Carniolan bees, sorry, and Italian bees. And they found very similar results and promising results. Uh, the selected uh, stock, they had better overwintering success, higher honey production, and they also have had a, a higher proportion of mutilated mites and a lower varroa destructor population growth. So once again, this shows that uh, with work and uh, a lot of uh, scoring on patients, this could be, uh, could be done. And then in parallel at the University of Guelph, um, Ernesto Guzman and his team, they were working on this selection program, but it was mostly based on low varroa growth. So that um, idea of, assessing mite levels in the spring and then again in the fall, subtracting and selecting for colonies that had low mite growth and high mite growth. Although they also incorporated other traits such as mite mutilation and varroa sensitive hygiene. So this uh, bidirectional selection um, has some uh, research uh, justification for, for, uh, for doing both to compare them, to see, to know more about this trait in the molecular aspect. Um, but the main or the practical um, objective of this project is to give breeders a protocol that they can follow and select for a low varroa growth. So very briefly, this um, selection program started uh, with generation zero in 2018 with more than 300 colonies from different backgrounds, genetic backgrounds. It, the, the varroa growth was assessed and then they selected the extreme genotypes, six LVG and six HVG. They let them over winter and the next year, they grafted queens from three of the colonies that were selected and these queens, um, the colonies were, or the bees, or yeah, the colonies uh, with these queens were assessed again for low varroa growth and high varroa growth, and they repeated the process for generation two. Um, this, uh, the queens were mated um, in an open mating system with a yard that had no apiaries five kilometers around them, uh, just thinking about realistic conditions that beekeepers could face. Um, and it's interesting what they found. They also found that the LVG bees had better overwintering success, uh, lower levels of deformed wing virus. Um, so again, it shows uh, promising results. They also had lower uh, mite increase compared to the high varroa growth bees. So the practical aspect of this select, uh, selection program is that we can assess very uh, easily mite levels using sticky papers or alcohol wash with a difference or, or a, uh, between 16 weeks. 
And with this, we can calculate the mite population growth and select for colonies that show the trait that we want. That means low varroa growth. And in the, in the selection, we can also consider our other traits of importance, such as hygienic behavior, defensive behavior, overwintering success, or honey yield. And the idea, well, the, this is a graph just to remind us on how uh, this varroa population uh, growth works and when it's critical to do these assessments. Uh, one of the things that we have to consider as breeders is that uh, to implement this strategy or this breeding program, um, we need more than 100 colonies to start or to select. We need to consider our management practices, that is, what are we using to control a varroa mice within the season? And I've heard um, this from Ernesto Guzman, but also consider that selection is a long-term goal. So um, if we start the selection process, it will take time and uh, it has to be year after year of, of selecting. And then, um, Having this low varroa growth and high varroa growth uh, also allowed us to compare them and to do some genetic uh, analysis. And we, hopefully in the future, we can implement a more sophisticated approaches such as marker assisted selection or genomic assist assisted selection. Um, and this can uh, provide an extra uh, tool for beekeepers to enhance their records, complement their scores when they are conducting their selection. Um, and there will be other, other things into consideration, such as which traits we want to incorporate into our stock. So the results of this selection program uh, are available. They are in open access uh, publication. So if someone's interested, you can access these um, you can just Google uh, some of the keywords and you can you would be able to see the article. And here is, um, I guess, myself and Alvaro de la Mora, who is the current PhD student in charge of this selection, this breeding program. So going back to integrated pest management, we got, have covered more uh, most of the components of the IPM including awareness and education, the importance of monitoring our mites. Uh, one thing that we emphasize here is to monitor before and after treatment and make sure that the treatment worked. And I guess that is uh, related to the previous uh, presentation and something to consider as well. So we um, touched on cultural methods and mechanical methods, some of the genetic tools that we have or can potentially have or implement to help our bees uh, control mite levels. And then we have treatments. Uh, I will not cover this aspect very much, but uh, we have some options such as essential oils, organic acids, synthetic acaricides. So the idea is to use them depending on the mite levels and be uh, aware of the time of the year, the temperature, like it was discussed previously. Um, and what we, uh, we can do and what tools are we using as an integrated uh, approach. Um, so as a conclusion, uh, I guess Varroa is, st is still one of the number one problems for the beekeeping industry. And integrated pest management seems to be the best strategy to control my levels. And uh, we should consider emphasizing genetics as the first line of defense that beekeepers can have uh, to control this parasite in a long term. Uh, just as a, a, a brief um, parenthesis, um, this, uh, the technology transfer program in BC started in November. And just to start, we wanted to reach out to beekeepers and we did a small survey. And it turns out that uh, beekeepers named Varroa the structure as their number one challenge, followed by overwinter colony mortality, which was not surprising and possibly related. Uh, there were some good aspects. Um, most of the beekeepers said that they do monitor for varroa mites, and just interestingly, that their preferred method is um, icing sugar method followed by alcohol wash. So we had some engagement uh, from uh, beekeepers, I, I would say a, a good engagement from beekeepers in, in the province, and the technology transfer program is currently uh, conducting some applied research 
focus on revising borough economic thresholds. We are monitoring mites and taking samples to conduct a metagenomic analysis. We're covering five regions of the province. The province is huge and uh, the regions are very different in their weather, uh, their type of beekeeping. Uh, so we're trying to cover um, most of the, of the uh, climates and, and of the types of beekeeping. And we are also conducting a citizen science study, mostly focused on small scale beekeepers. And they are um, helping us by providing information on their management practices at their mite levels to complement this, um, this revision. We're also conducting workshops on integrated pest management and hands-on um, strategies or methods to monitor for mites. In the near future, we want to focus on um, collaborating with other provinces and other tech transfer programs and to assess amitra's resistance. And in a long term, we want to focus on selective uh, breeding and uh, support our Bee Breeders Association and also support applied research with different universities and, um, and research institutes. Um, if there are beekeepers from BC in this uh, conference, and if you're interested in collaborating with us, uh, feel free to visit our website uh, and just click on get involved or send us an email. And it's very easy to do it. And we really need that information to uh, complement our study and see what's happening uh, out there. And with this, I think we cover it all. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and for your attention. And thank you to everyone that stayed until the end. And um, this is a, uh, if you want to know more about the program, uh, there's, we have some social media, feel free to email us. And um, well, we're working with uh, so, uh, some funding partners and also some research partners such as the University of British Columbia. So thank you. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Morphine. That was that was great. And we do have a few questions. Um, but before we launch into that, first of all, I I noticed that both you um both you and Dr. Kolhanik have mentioned that your papers are open access. And so I'm so um pleased with that because you know, you researchers work so hard to get <laughs> this data and then you know, there's this sort of middleman in terms of the the journals, which you know can't run on on you know uh, money grown on trees <laughs> necessarily, and so you know they have a cost to it. But then that does inhibit how far the information can reach people. You know, and so open access is, I'm all for that being the wave of the of the future, but you know, becoming the meaning starting now and really becoming the 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 main sort of standard by which we can all access information because um, unless you're with a university or have connections with the university it can be hard sometimes to get these papers um, at an affordable cost so that's just great I also I'm just thrilled to hear you talk about genetics being the first line of defense because I've often <laughs> kind of rallied that same cry to folks you know it's it's again it's this other you know, tool in your toolkit, but it's at the foundation of everything because depending on what stock you have and its ability or inability to cope, right, and adapt, that's going to dictate your whole management. And, and so it really is at a very fundamental level, your real, your first line of defense. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, let's go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say that. Thank you. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, we do have a few questions. Um, one is actually about the recordings, and I've reached out to Etienne to double check. I know that when we made the switch in uh, January to have this be, um, you know, webinars for, for members, uh, first and foremost, that they paused on posting them onto YouTube, but I know that um, that it's been discussed. So definitely, uh, you know, those recordings will be made available to attendees. Um, and you'll you'll get some information about that um, in the near future. Um, and then for for Nuria, here's here's a uh, couple questions. So the first one is, uh, did not quite understand how requeening is a method for controlling Varroa. 
Can you please reiterate the explanation? Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, when we read queen, uh, we, re we uh, take out the queen for a little bit. We have to let uh, the colony sit for, for some days. Then we introduce either a cell or a mated queen, and that will create a disruption in egg laying. And we have to consider that a queen lays around 1,500 eggs per day. Uh, so that will disrupt the, uh, the developmental cycle of the worker bees and the drones, and as a consequence of the mites. And again, it's not the only thing that we can use. Cultural and mechanical methods have to be combined, and it's a, as a support mechanism. Um, in and we know that uh, treating only with chemicals, either essential oil, acids, or synthetic, that there we have challenges. We have to play with weather conditions, with um, lower efficacies, not necessarily that they are not working at all, but maybe that the, their efficacy can be reduced um, because of weather conditions in the case of thymol or uh, in the case of tau fluvalinate, because it has, like it was mentioned before, it has been used in the market uh, for a while and perhaps it's not 99% effective now, but maybe 80%. So we have to consider all these uh, these things and have as I don't know what I'm just kept talking, but yeah, we just have to <laughs> use as many tools as we as we can. Right, those brood brood breaks can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of tie this back to WSU, um, you know, the cold storage storage research, which didn't get talked about here, but maybe in the future we can get um, uh, Dr. Hopkins or some of his grad students to talk about it, but. You know, the idea behind cold storage um, and utilizing that for brood breaks too, like during a summer, you know, heat, dearth or what have you can can really play a role in that and getting those numbers down. So, um, yeah, brood breaks, which basically means, you know, removing your queen or caging your queen is, yeah, exactly. is making a split or something will help with that. Um, we got some questions rolling in. Awesome. OK, so let's see. The next question is. How far are we from a bee that can truly resist Varroa? It's a long breeding program, but any idea of a timeline? In your crystal ball, what do you see? <laughs> no, it, to be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, if you see um, the study that was done at the University of Guelph, it was three years of selection. And uh, the low varroa growth, uh, or sorry, that the varroa growth compared to LVG and HVG was significantly different from 1.7 to, I, I forget, 5 or, or something close to that. So it can be, it can be achieved. Um, and with hygienic behavior, there are many groups, many breeders that have been using and incorporating that trade in their programs, and it's proven to be successful. So. I think I have, I don't know how long, <laughs> but yeah. Well, and then we have to think about, you know, once we achieve it, right? Like we're, we're in the dynamic living laboratory of the world, which is constantly changing. So that quest is, is really rather infinite, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, that whole pathogen interaction and what uh, guards those varroa mites have under their, their sleeves. Right, most definitely. Mm -hmm. So here's a related question. Um, uh, is there a difference between HVG and LVG in honey production? And uh, this is from Christina. She kind of goes on to say, what's the heritability of the trait H and do you have an idea of how many genes are involved? Okay, so let, let, me, let me see if I remember all. About the honey production, I know Alvaro de la Mora, who is the PhD student in charge of this project now. Um, he uh, he's working on that. So I know they measured honey production, but I don't know uh, what results they have. However, in a previous study that, in a, that was conducted at the same institution some years ago, Dr. Berna Emsen found that uh, honeybees um, that, are uh, that didn't have the, the parasitosis produce 50% more honey compared to the other ones. So that's that's significant. And they were also working with these uh, different genotypes. Uh, then the other one was the heritability. So for grooming behavior, there is um, a grooming behavior in general. Uh, there are different uh, publications. Some of them show high heritability of 0.7 and other ones are very low, like 0 0.05. So we still don't know and we don't know if these um, 
trait is linked to uh, maternal or paternal, but it looks like it's parental, so coming from both. So in some traits, you can, for example, hygienic behavior, it comes from the mother's side, defensive behavior, um, as, um, where did I, from the, from the uh, drone, uh, that side, but this one it appears that it has uh, both influences. And I don't know if I missed another question or another. Um, well, that, it was definitely a very loaded question. So <laughs> it's I put it in the answered column, but um, but if you want to check it out to to respond, you know, via typing, you can. And then two more questions for sure. One of them, I had the same question too. This is from an anonymous attendee. I love the B artwork. Who painted it? If you don't mind sharing. <laughs> the the B artwork. Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. So this is a, an artist from Ontario, from St. Jacobs, near, near Elmira. And I, I, uh, her name is Frances uh, McGregor. So I'll, yeah, I can for sure share her info. She has very nice paintings. And I like that one of them has a Varroa mite. <laughs> true, true life. It's, it's a true, <laughs> true image there. Um, Awesome. Okay, last question from our Q&A, and then we'll open it up to our panelists in case they have any questions. Um, this is from Marlene. Genetics first line of defense. I really want to learn more about this as we have a short cutthroat season in the Yukon. Um, they're sorry that they missed most of the meeting, but wondering, um, but do the papers include some detail on the genetic makeup of the Loboroa bees? Um, and, you know, looking at the different bees that are imported. I mean, this is kind of related to the, you know, how long is it going to take for us to really find a varroa resistant bee? But, um, but yeah, is there in your sort of, you know, experience and also research, have you come across any, I guess, particular genetic strains that seem to be promising? Yeah, so uh, that's a very interesting question, all of them. So thank you for that. I, I feel that I've been challenged, like looking in my <laughs> and so um, the, for the LBG and this late uh, study or the latest study, it's very interesting and very applicable for bee breeders uh, because they started with a, a general population of Ontario bees, general beekeepers. They signed up 300 honeybee colonies. Uh, they included Apis mellifera ligustica, Bokfas strain, uh, whatever was available. And then they started the selection. So um, that's something that all breeders could do, although it requires a high number of colonies to start the breeding program, more than 100. This project started with 300. So either a big scale, like a, a big enough operation or the collaboration with different uh, operations, they could achieve this. Um, there are some genotypes that seem to be uh, more resistant to honeybees and to be better groomers including the Primorsky line and Africanized bees. So far, that those are the ones that I'm familiar with. And then the LVG selected strain. Awesome. Yeah, and it's just amazing to think of, you know, how bees have adapted. You know, they're all, honeybees are, are one sort of species, right? But then they have all these subspecies. And what we what we know of them is, still unfolding like as we as we really start to look and get these additional um tools right and technological advancements they help us to really understand and to look more in depth at what's what's the difference between these different kinds of bees and what allows them to be like that and and depending on where you are you know is there really a super bee you know <laughs> there's a reason why we have different kinds, you know, because they're, they are specialists in that sense when they become really nuanced with a particular location and familiar with the flows and the, um, uh, the seasonality of things. The climate, absolutely. I, I, I thought about that, how they have adapted to different weather conditions, to different altitudes. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, we still have a lot to, to consider. Ian, and as an extra note that it's, uh, I guess, promising to um, the group of Dr. Greg Hunt, they also started with a variety of genotypes. They started the, their selection with a uh, local bees. I think they included some BSH strains. So, so uh, and they were able to slowly select for those traits. 
Right. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I don't want to get on my soapbox about breeding, but it's just obviously it's it's such a passion of mine because it's it's another rabbit hole that you can go down into and it's a whole labyrinth and learning um, you know, just every season's different and every hive has its own personality. And so especially here you know, on this continent where a lot of our bees are mixed, you know, they're, they're a reflection of our peoples. And so that makes it a little bit more challenging because again, it's not just one particular kind, but it's also, you know, what's going to work well on one side of the country is going to be very different than the other side and highlands, lowlands and everything in between. So. And also well, I guess the, the, the bees, uh, their diversity and their genetic system, it, what what's make what makes them adapt so well to so many different things and uh, just to oh, like Afri I'm just thinking of Africanized bees just to uh, take over from other populations but that also makes them a challenge for a selective breeding. Yeah, it does. It does. Which you know, we'll we'll definitely have some talks on that in the future, whether it's instrumental insemination or isolated breeding apiaries. You know, there's there's a few different ways to to work towards those things but yeah they are they are still very wild in that sense which makes it so so much fun and and so dynamic um let me see here i think we have uh one more question um this is from dan payne it lives in alaska and just uh received some oxalic acid dehyd dehydrate sorry what is the best resource for how to apply do i need to have broodless frames to apply this fall um, we'll have all the honey pull off in two weeks from now. Um, I don't know if you're, do you feel like you want to answer that or? <laughs> I'll answer to the best of my knowledge, but then I'll let someone with more knowledge on the regulations in Alaska to take over. But yeah, I guess that I would consider um, if you have brood or not. So uh, oxalic acid will not kill the mites inside the cells. So I guess it would have to be broodless uh, periods. Mm -hmm. um, about honey, uh, I well, uh, the only treatment uh, that we can apply when there are supers would be formic acid. So I guess it would be after taking off the supers. And then the other question was, what is the best um, way to apply that? I would think my suggestion would be go for what you're comfortable and you know. And if you are not familiar with oxalic acid, find a beekeeper with experience to, to show you how to do it. Uh, or go to their yards first. Um, oxalic acid and formic acid can be very hard on the on the beekeeper as well. So just don't underestimate those acids and wear protective equipment. If you choose to do vaporizations, you have to be very careful on how to use them. So if you haven't used them before and you go that route, I would suggest um, uh, going with a mentor or a beekeeper friend first and see how how they are applying it the dribble is not that hard like you just make sure you have the protective equipment you mix it and you can use the the syringe and there are some very good um, videos and uh, resources uh, on how to use it i would also suggest make sure that you're following the regulations of your area mm -hmm. uh, and that you're using resources uh, that apply to your weather and to your conditions because beekeeping in Florida and northward climates would be completely different so uh, they would have different outcomes so I think that would be the general recommendation I don't know if someone has something else to add um Kelly typed a, a, a response in the uh, Q&A too thanks Kelly um do you want to would you like to pipe in here and have any um additional thoughts to add no, I think that was a great answer. I just put the label in, you know, that has all the official restrictions and has some good advice for things not to do. Um, yeah, just be careful. The vapor especially is super, super dangerous. So um, yeah, just make sure you're careful. Um, but yeah, other people put Randy Oliver and Honeybee Health Coalition. So um, all those are good. And then I think the advice about um, asking someone local to you who has used it before is really good advice also. Yeah, most definitely. Um, one last question. This is from Joe Lamont. Um, as African bees have a smaller pupation period, 
do they have less likes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one. That's an excellent question. And yeah, their developmental stage is a uh, stage is a little bit shorter uh, than the European bee. So that's one of the hypotheses of why they are uh, more resistant to mites. And they have other things like better at, at self grooming. They divide more. They don't care about honey production, so they are uh, splitting, dividing, and uh, all the time. Swarming, they swarm more, and if things get um, very contaminated, they'll have scum, no problem. They don't have have no regrets on leaving the the beekeeper. So there are different mechanisms of behaviors that uh, I think have worked on their advantage. But yeah, developmental timing is one of them. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. This has been super informative and really appreciate you carving out some time in your um, busy bee season schedule <laughs> for um, and your evening time too. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, would either of you or both of you have any sort of final comments or anything you'd like to say? Uh, only to thank, um, for, thank you for the invitation and uh, I'm very glad to be here with you and thank you for everyone that joined. And uh, I hope we can keep in touch and thank you. Awesome. Yeah, just thanks for having us. Um, I think yeah, our presentations were very compatible. So I think that made for a really great program and I was really happy to see Nuria's all really great information. Yeah, I definitely have to say um, Etienne works works really hard to find nice uh, complimentary <laughs> speakers. So I'm so glad both of you were available. And yeah, we'll have to have you come back because I feel like there's so much more we can talk about, you know, <laughs> um, in all regards uh, with bees. So yeah, awesome. You're getting some praise in the Q&A. So that's really kind. 